Hello and welcome to Gogi and All the World. Today I've been asked to do a comparison between the King James Version and the New Living Translation. I ask you to watch until the end because when someone discusses Bible translations, it always gets uh, somebody upset. Someone will be hit the wrong way. I'm just going to try to share the facts and uh, try to share what the Word of God says about this. And uh, I just want you to watch until the end. Give it an opportunity to hear a, hear a hearing uh, about both of these. So why is this an important topic? Well, I think we can see one reason why this is important by looking at the life of someone who actually died to get the Bible into other people's hands in their language. The publishing group that put together the New Living Translation is called Tyndale Publishing. It is named after one of the first men to successfully defy the Catholic Church's ruling in his time that one cannot translate the Word of God into the English language or face the penalty of death. This is also the man whose work most inspired and was used by the KJV translators. Uh, this man's name was William Tyndale. William Tyndale said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. And then he said that if God spared his life, he would cause the boy that drives the plow in England to mow more of the scriptures than the Pope himself. So Tyndale desired that a plow boy could read the scriptures. That means he could read in his own language, simple and plain. Does that mean that Tyndale wanted a plow boy to read his interpretation of the Bible, though? Or did he want God's word to be reflected as accurately as possible in the plow boy's language? I believe... It was accuracy because Tyndale knew the very first temptation of mankind. Do you know the first temptation of mankind in the Garden of Eden? It wasn't to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God told them not to eat. It actually was to question what God had said about that subject. And it was by faulty interpretation of what God said that may have caused Eve to more earnestly desire its fruit. The first words that the devil ever uttered in the scripture was, Hath God said? Or, as the NLT puts it, Did God really say? Did God really say that? Now why does that matter? What God has said is the authority for his created beings. He is the master. He is the creator. What he said is highly important. It is utmost importance that it be correctly preserved and passed down to us. Adam was told God's word on the subject, but somehow it got lost in translation uh, to Eve. And she had a false idea that not only she shouldn't eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but also that she should not touch it. Look in the scriptures. You'll see what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, Adam didn't have God's words written down. But we do, though, don't we? We have had those words for centuries written down for us. Now, throughout history, different groups have arisen to say they are the authority on what God has said rather than the written authority that we have had. And this always causes problems. For example, the Pope believes he is the authority on what God has said. Church tradition rises up and overtakes uh, the authority on what God has said in many churches. But the only place we can be certain of what God has said is in the preserved, inerrant words of God written down in a book. Now, how accurate to what was originally written down do you want your English Bible to be? Today, we're going to look at the KJV and the NLT. Both of these English translations have drastically different and sometimes similar philosophies that have driven their acceptance into many churches today. We will look at the facts behind their histories, the similarities, and the differences, and at the end ask ourselves if we believe that these two translations are both accurate reflections of the same Hebrew and Greek words that inspired by God that William Tyndale was literally killed for bringing into the English language. Let's begin with the history of both. Tyndale's history actually flows directly into the King James Bible's history. 
Tyndale sought approval from the bishop in London to make a new English translation of the Bible. That permission was denied, and Tyndale moved uh, to Germany in 1524. There he completed the translation into the New Testament in English and began to have it printed. The copies were then smuggled into England in cases of merchandise, barrels, sacks of flour, and corn so that the common people could have the Word of God. Now, King Henry VIII in England opposed Tyndale's translation, and British authorities would have liked to have Tyndale return to England. And he wrote to King Henry VIII that if the English text of the Bibles were made freely available to all his subjects, then he would gladly return to England and submit to whatever pain, torture, or even death that Henry might decide. But in 1535, there was a traitor in his midst, and a young Englishman tricked Tyndale into revealing his hiding place. Tyndale was tried and sentenced to death for translating the Word of God into English. His last words were a prayer. He cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And the Lord did. Within three years, the King's eyes were opened. Miles Coverdale uh, completed the remainder of the Old Testament, which Tyndale was denied by his death and was permitted to publish England's first authorized version, the Great Bible of 1539. That great dam that the Catholics had built to stop the flow of the good news had been pierced. Now this flow would become unstoppable as the powerful KJV would come from the undertaking and many plowboys would have the pleasure of reading what God has said over the coming centuries. In 1611, after seven years of work, 47 scholars produced the King James Bible. This Bible drew significantly from Tyndale's original work. One estimate suggests that the New Testament in the King James Version is 83% Tyndale's words. It came to be considered the standard in English translations for the last four centuries. It would be slightly updated from 1611 with four updates until 1769. Now let's take a look at the New Living Translations history. The New Living Translations history begins actually with the Living Bible. The Living Bible is a paraphrase. That means a rewording of something written or spoken by someone else. And this Living Bible was first published in 1971 and was the product of a man named Kenneth N. Taylor. In a 1979 interview for Christianity Today, Taylor explained the inspiration for preparing the Living Bible. The children were one of the chief inspirations for producing the Living Bible. Our family devotions were tough going because of the difficulty we had understanding the King James Version, which we were then using, or the Revised Standard Version, which we used later. All too often, I would ask questions to be sure the children understood, and they would shrug their shoulders. They didn't know what the passage was talking about, so I would explain it. I would paraphrase it for them and give them the thought. It suddenly occurred to me one afternoon that I should write out the reading for that evening thought by thought, rather than doing it on the spot during our devotional time. So I did, and read the chapter to the family that evening with exciting results. Now, many welcomed this new Bible, whether they were evangelical or Catholic. As a matter of fact, two different editions were created for both of them. The Catholic Living Bible was officially approved by the Pope with an introduction written by Pope John Paul II. The Evangelical Edition in 1962 was used by Billy Graham after he asked permission to use a portion of the epistles, which he renamed the Living Letters, and he would hand them out as his crusades. There were criticisms, though. Many complained it dumbed down the Bible and was not accurately relaying what was being said in an unbiased manner. Thus, plans were made to make it as close to a respectable translation as possible and place it right on the edge of being a paraphrase. By doing this, it was assumed that uh, others would feel more comfortable purchasing it for use in pulpits and pews across the country. Uh, one advertisement shows a lady holding on to her New Living Translation with the idea that she finally has the Bible. Work on the New Living Translation began in 1989 with 90 translators. It was published in July 1996, 25 years after the publication of the Living Bible. Soon after, a revision of that first text was begun and was released in 2004. In 2007, another revision was released that comprised mostly minor textual or footnote changes. Another revision was released in 2013 and 2015 with minor changes throughout. Now, in 2016, Tyndale House Publishers and the Conference of Catholic Bishops of India Commission for the Bible collaborated to produce a New Living Translation Catholic Edition. After reviewing these changes introduced in the Catholic edition, Tyndale publishers approved and adopted the Indian bishops' edits into the main body of the 2015 edition, where they will appear in all subsequent editions for all. 
So in all, since 1996, the NLT has been revised five times until it could be considered a uh, ecumenical Bible for any and all. Now let's look at the similarities. The main similarity is that you could be saved by reading either one of these translations. Even with these Catholic edits that have occurred in the New Living Translation because the Catholic view of salvation and the evangelical view of salvation are wide and apart. Uh, but that main gospel message is still there. So a similarity we can find is that anyone could understand salvation and be saved by reading either text. But one could possibly understand salvation from reading a children's storybook Bible as well. One could also be confused by a children's storybook Bible. So what would be the problem with carrying a storybook Bible to your church instead of a, a, a regular Bible? You can't study it with others, for one thing. It isn't exactly what was originally written down by men inspired of God to write is another. It isn't for study. And that's what brings us to the many differences between the King James Version and the New Living Translation. First of all, two different original text references. The Old Testament in all English translations is generally agreed upon, but since the 1800s there has been this fight amongst Bible scholars that prefer a constantly changing Greek text for the New Testament over the traditional Greek text that has been passed down for many centuries. The traditional text is commonly called the Textus Receptus, while the other compilation, which cuts most of God's words away, is called the Critical Text. The critical text, according to Dr. David Sorensen, author of Touch Not the Unclean Thing, deletes 19 verses, 45 verses have large chunks deleted, and 2,800 Greek words are deleted. That's the equivalent of First and Second Peter. Now, with all those changes and deletions, here's the problem. One of these two cannot be correct because things that are different are simply not the same. The New King James Version, which chose to use the same traditional text of the New Testament as the King James Version, within its preface, has information that will be beneficial for us in this discussion. The King James New Testament was based on the traditional text of the Greek-speaking churches, first published in 1516, and later called the Textus Receptus, or Received Text. Although based on the relatively few available manuscripts, these were representative of many more which existed at the time, but only became known later. In the late 19th century, B. Westcott and F. Hort uh, taught that this text had been officially edited by the 4th century church, but a total lack of historical evidence for this event has forced a revision of the theory. It is now widely held that the Byzantine text that largely supports the Textus Receptus has as much right as the Alexandrian or any other tradition to be weighed in determining the text of the New Testament. In other words, this Westcott and Horton in the 19th century taught a theory that the only reason people uniformly trusted the traditional text of the New Testament that flowed from those ancient Greek churches was because the ancient church had corrupted it to make it read more smoothly. So they believed that there was a corrupt New Testament that had been passed around for centuries. The preface continues, Since the 1880s, most contemporary translations of the New Testament have relied upon relatively few manuscripts discovered chiefly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Such translations depend primarily on two manuscripts, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, because of their great age. The Greek text obtained by using these sources and the related papyri, our most ancient manuscripts, is known as the Alexandrian text, which is used to create the critical text. However, some scholars have grounds for doubting the faithfulness of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, since they often disagree with one another, and Sinaiticus exhibits excessive omission. This is why translations such as the NKJV and now the MEV choose to use the same text that the KJV used for its New Testament. They believe it is correct and isn't adding to the Bible, even though the NKJV does add footnotes that references those differences. The NLT translators and uh, other modern translations are saying that the KJV and the rest of the Bibles throughout history added to the Bible. Their evaluation has caused them to make the decision to change and take away several passages from the traditional text. Now, in the NLT, as well as the KJV, it states the danger of adding to or taking away from God's words across the centuries. Either the KJV or the NLT is guilty of doing this because they both claim to be the Word of God, yet one has obviously either added to or taken away from God's words. Now, this is my personal evaluation. I don't believe the KJV translators violated God's prohibition by adding these words to Scripture at all. Some have a strong background to be in the text. Others have less evidence, but I still trust the whole of what has been passed down. 
There are other passages in the NLT that are left in the text, but they're put in brackets with warnings that they can't be trusted. One of those passages is Mark 16, 9 through 20. The NLT tries very hard, perhaps harder than most other English translations, to make you doubt that Mark 16, 9 through 20 is true. It says in the NLT, the most ancient manuscripts of Mark conclude with verse 16, verse 8. Later manuscripts add one or both of the following endings, and then it displays both. They actually have two different texts that are fighting for dominance. This obviously corrodes the reliability of trusting the Bible. Arthur Farstad was the general editor of the New King James Version, and he also wrote a book called In the Great Tradition, explaining why he used uh, the traditional text of the New Testament with the New King James Version. And in that book, he makes a strong defense of Mark 16, 9 through 20, and discusses these two supposed different endings that one must choose from. The New American Standard Bible 1971 also has two different endings of Mark 16 as the New Living Translation does. Farstad says the New American Standard Bible puts this paragraph in brackets and has a note reading some of the oldest manuscripts omit from verse 9 through 20. This version adds an alternative proposed reading for the end of the book stating that this reading is found in a few later manuscripts and versions. These notes are misleading. The sum of the oldest manuscripts are really just two manuscripts. Actually, the reliability of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus is strictly a theory, though widely taught. The point that the footnotes in most Bibles fail to report is that 1,400 manuscripts do contain this passage. Further, St. Jerome, when he translated the New Testament into Latin, included Mark 16, 9-20. It is significant that he did so in the 4th century, when the descending Egyptian manuscripts were also written. Apparently, these two copies, which lacked this passage, were not representative in their own time. In short, the long ending of Mark is on a firm foundation and widely supported. Let me ask you on the other side of the screen, do you accept this as Holy Scripture? There are also several word deletions that make huge differences uh, between the critical text and the received text. One of those is found in Matthew 5.22. There we see Jesus saying that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. But in the New Living Translation, it says, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. The phrase without a cause has been removed from the NLT, and just the fact that you're going to get angry at someone will send you to judgment. That means that Jesus Christ should face judgment. Because, who is saying this? Because he got angry, didn't he? In Mark 3, 5, it says that Jesus was angry. So the NLT is implying that Jesus is a sinner here by his own words, despite the fact that the Bible says that he never sinned and is without sin. There are not only word deletions, there are also word changes. For example, in Luke 2.33, uh, the King James Version tells us that Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, speaking of Jesus. But in the New Living Translation, it says Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Now, this is a flat-out attack on the virgin birth in the New Living Translation. By changing the name Joseph to father, or by saying his parents, it throws away the idea that Joseph is separate. Uh, he is not the father of Jesus. He is the stepfather of Jesus. So this is an attack on the virgin birth. But they believe that Joseph, his name was inserted later on uh, by pious Christians who uh, believed that someone would get confused within the text. Well, I believe God didn't want us to get confused at all. He put it in the text. All of this confusion comes from the NLT's acceptance of the use of the critical text. Another difference is two different translation philosophies. Now the King James Version is a word-for-word -word translation. It's translating that Hebrew and Greek word and it's bringing directly over. While the New Living Translation is a thought-for-thought -thought translation, which means it's taking those words and sentences and translating them in to the general thoughts. The New Living Translation, according to the publishers, is intended to be easily accessible to readers of modern English. As part of this effort, weights, measures, monies, dates, times, etc. are translated into modern terms. Some phrases are translated into contemporary English. For example, Luke 23, 48 says they beat their breasts. They translate that as they went home in deep sorrow. They use gender-inclusive language where the editors believe that is appropriate. For example, 
when someone is speaking to a brother, they will write brothers and sisters, adding and sisters into the text where they feel uh, that's what is being relayed rather than giving you the word for word exactness. A thought for thought translation plays fast and loose with the interpretation of scripture and that's supposed to make it more instantly understandable. But do you want looseness in your Bible or do you want accuracy? People don't like the thee and the thou and the thy and the ye, but in actuality, this is showing us more of an exactness in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16 through 17 actually shows us this. Now, you have to understand that the, the thy and the thee and the thou are always going to be singular when you're reading the Bible, while the ye and the you are plural, and that's what's being inferred to you. Uh, now, let's read the text of the NLT and the KJV on 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. And I want you to see something pretty amazing. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. NLT. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So when we look at that, we don't understand that the whole church, to gather together, are the temple of God. Ye are the temple. Speaking to the whole group, you're all the temple of God. Instead, it looks like it's just you. You, personal. And uh, that is fine in a sense, but God has sent his word not just to speak to you, but to speak to us all across the centuries with one uniform message. What about John 3.16, where the NLT changes the only begotten son into the one and only son of God? The problem with that is that we are all the sons of God. The Bible relays that in other passages, that we are all the sons of God. Jesus is not simply God's one and only son or his only son. Adam is God's son in Luke 3, 38. God has many angelic sons in Genesis 6, 2. But whereas these other sons were created sons, Jesus is God's only begotten son. So to say that he is the only son of God doesn't imply the full meaning. You see that word begotten, uh, it means something. There's a purpose in that. The Greek word is monogenes, and it means a special fathering. It is a compound word of mono, meaning only, and gene, meaning begotten. The literal translation is only begotten. This distinction, right with theological significance, is made clear only by translating this as only begotten. Scholars who argue that it just means unique are just pulling the car to the head of the horse. Jesus is unique because he is God's only begotten son. Another difference is a fixed translation versus a culturally changing translation. One of the places this is on display is on 1 Corinthians 6, 9. This is the passage that one of the stars from Duck Dynasty quoted, and he was almost had his TV show taken away from him when he was simply trying to quote the Bible. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 gives a list of those who will not inherit the kingdom of God because of the, the practice of sin uh, that they are doing. Uh, in that list, is homosexuality. The King James Version didn't have the word homosexual uh, as a reference in 1611 or 1769. That word wasn't invented until later. But there they are translating two words. One is uh, the effeminate and one is abusers of themselves with mankind. The Greek word being translated as effeminate is melikos and uh, it means soft. Uh, it means effeminate. It means uh, the receiver in a homosexual relationship. Abusers of themselves with mankind is uh, the translation for a synecotes, and it means a sodomite, someone who is the giver in a homosexual relationship. Now, the NLT translates these two, uh, the effeminate, as male prostitutes, and then it translates the abuser of themselves with mankind as homosexuality. Now this is important because if you use the idea of male prostitute for melikos, then you are saying this is a homosexual relationship that is forced or it is being done outside of a homosexual marriage, which is a new invention uh, that has never been heard of 
uh, in the history of mankind. So where now the verse doesn't offend those who trust in homosexual marriage, where the King James Version still has the potential to offend uh, someone on this point. Now, if you look at the Living Bible, you'll see that it mentions only homosexuals shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And doesn't say anything about male prostitutes. This is significant because this was before this invention of homosexual marriage. So there we see how the New Living Translation can change and weave with the ideas of the culture just by changing a few words. Here's another example of a, of a change that uh, may be even more worrisome. The name of the devil is Lucifer. Uh, it, it's popular today to, to name different characters on television as Lucifer. Uh, that's the name of a popular television program today. But the name of the devil is completely eliminated from the New Living Translation. It's only mentioned once in Isaiah 14, 12. The King James Version says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down the ground, which does weaken the nations? The NLT's interpretation is how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star. Now this passage is talking about how Lucifer fell from heaven, how the devil fell. And you would never know that name by just reading that. Funny enough, though, you would know it if you read the Living Bible. The Living Bible had, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you cut down to the ground, mighty though you were against the nations of the world? Now, the word is Hillel, and it means the morning star. It has that idea, and it was interpreted as Lucifer long ago because there are other passages within the Bible that refer to Jesus as the morning star. The tradition of the church has been to translate this word here as Lucifer from as early as the Latin Vulgate in order to differentiate it from that title of the morning star that is put upon Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Being a thought-for-thought -thought translation, which is supposed to lead people to understand the general meaning better at a glance, why would you confuse people about homosexuality and the name of the devil himself? In conclusion, do I want someone's interpretation of what God said or as close as possible to the original words in English? Am I comfortable with the deletion of words, phrases, and passages that have been in the Bible for centuries? Did William Tyndale get martyred or murdered, you might say, to provide you with these modern interpretations of what the Bible uh, says in English? or to give you as literal as possible all the original words of the Bible. The scripture says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Stay to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The diligent student of God's word won't be ashamed because he or she has studied out God's truth and learned of true salvation, just like William Tyndale, who defied the Pope, who kept the people of God in the dark about what the Word of God actually said by keeping it locked in a, a language that they could not read. Now, I've shown you the facts here today, and I think I've shown you my feelings as well at times, but I hope you've listened closely to the facts. All I can say, as Tyndale did, Lord God, please open the modern world's eyes. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.